In today's lesson, we're going to be talking about two ordinances of the church. The first being baptism in water, and the second being Holy Communion. Uh, these, of course, are very important practices that are a part of our worship and a part of our relationship with God and also with the body of Christ here in the earth. And so I want to begin by talking about baptism in water. When we, ask, when we think about baptism in water, P.C. Nelson asked four questions concerning baptism in water. First of all, what was the mode of baptism in Bible times? Number two, was it, uh, what is the significance or symbolism of baptism? And number three, what is the right formula for administering the ordinance? And number four, who is scripturally qualified to be baptized? And I'd like for us to take a few moments and answer some of those questions, or answer those questions and maybe some others as we go along today. First of all, how did they baptize in Bible times? Uh, whenever you talk about it, it's actually the act of baptism that we're talking about. And of course, you're probably familiar with various denominations and religious groups that baptize in various forms. Uh, there are those that use a practice that's described as sprinkling. Uh, there are those that uh, use practices uh, that uh, are immersion, as we're going to talk about today. And there's various ways that all of these are accomplished. Uh, there are some that believe that you have to actually be in running water uh, because Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and it was a moving body of water. But what you do see again and again in the scripture is that it was baptism by immersion, which means that they actually went under the water. So let's talk about a few of those points. First of all, the ordinance of water baptism requires water. That makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? It requires water. If you look in the scripture in Acts chapter 8, as the New Testament was unfolding, or excuse me, the early church was unfolding, as we see here in the New Testament record in the book of Acts, you discover in Acts chapter 36 a great story of, of how... Uh, Philip came up upon the Ethiopian eunuch and he was reading in the scriptures uh, as he was making his journey and Philip comes up and, and overtakes the chariot in which he was in and by the Spirit of the Lord begins to witness and share uh, with the eunuch what he was reading in the scripture, what it really meant. And so after that was concluded, the scripture says, uh, verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so we know that you've got to have water in order to be baptized. Number two, the scripture shows us that baptism requires a lot of water. Uh, enough that you can be immersed. And that's really what the word baptizo means, baptism, from which we get baptism. It means to be immersed or to go under and completely covered by the water. And then as you go along in the scripture, you find out the significance of that water baptism is that that water represents a burial. It represents a grave for the sin that's been a part of a person's life. Whenever we repent, we come to Christ, we are then able to be buried in baptism. And we see that. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says those very words. We're buried with him in baptism. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. And so that water baptism becomes an outward expression of the inward work that has happened. It becomes something in the natural that you can see, feel, touch, that you're able to fulfill and go through that is a representation of what's happened in the spirit on the inner man. And so as you've identified with Christ, you've identified with his death, where he died on the cross, went into the grave and rose from the dead. So it is you go down into the water and you come back up 
as representative of the new life that Christ has given to each of us. And so that baptism not only requires going down into the water and the burial, so to speak, that takes place there, but it also requires coming up out of the water and rising up. I've often heard people joke and tease a little bit about holding someone down. Well, don't ever hold them down too long. You don't want to invoke fear in their life. But as you're baptizing them, the significance is going down, but it's also in the coming up. Coming up and the newness of life. And so it's a wonderful blessing. The scripture says in Matthew 3.16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Acts 8.39, that same story we read, says when they came up out of the water. So there is that resurrection sense that's communicated through water baptism. In water baptism, there's also some real significance and symbolism to be seen regarding that death, burial, and resurrection experience. I want to read this passage from Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And so that's that picture of water baptism. It's our identifying with coming into agreement with the work of Christ in the inner man through an outward expression. This was something that Jesus did. This was something that Jesus had as a fulfillment in his own life. You'll remember in Matthew 3 where he came, he met John, he was baptized in water in the Jordan River. John didn't even think he should do it, but Jesus did it to fulfill the law, to fill, fulfill the prophecies that had been given. And so Jesus came up and was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and there did went through the temptation. And that's a whole other lesson we'll talk about sometime. But it was through that baptism that that was fulfilled. And it's important to understand the significance of baptism and as you see it in the scripture it is practiced in the form of immersion to go down into the water and so uh, it's important I think and I do want to say this that water baptism is not something to be taken lightly it's something that Jesus admonishes us to do and it's a powerful witness and it's so important to understand that there are there are places where people come to Christ and the witness of water baptism literally changes everything about their whole life. And I'm not just talking about the spiritual significance, but the fact that it is an open, outward testimony. And that's the thing. Christ wants us to testify of Him in our life. There is no such thing as being a closet Christian. There is no such thing as just hiding away. No, we're to be salt and light in the earth, and part of that is to be a public witness. And and our baptism in water is a public testimony and witness that we have decided to follow Christ. And we're going to walk with Him, and we're going to follow after Him. And remember, in the Great Commission, we're told to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So for us, this is the pattern in which we baptize. This is the formula that we use according to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus said it like this, All authority was given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the days, even to the end of the age. And so this was the instruction that Jesus gave, that we were to go and would be baptized and to receive that blessing in our life and to be a blessing as we testify to others. And so we are baptized into the name of Jesus, of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
And then the scripture goes on to teach us about who qualifies to be baptized. Is baptism, water baptism, just to be something that's done wholesale? In other words, just anybody that thinks it's a nice experience is to be baptized? Absolutely not. We're doing a disservice to people if we're baptizing them without them meeting the basic criteria. Now, we're not talking about uh, a laundry list as long as my arm of all the requirements and things that you have to fulfill in order to be baptized in water. But here's the list of what you must do to be baptized. Repent and believe the good news. It really boils down to just that simple. Mark 1.15 As a sinner that wants to be baptized, first thing we have to do is repent and believe. Repent and believe. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. In other words, you are to be, for, you are to have forgiveness to come and then get into the waters of baptism as a testimony of what has happened in your heart. How God has transformed your life. And so it's very important to understand that. That's why, if I might take a moment just to discuss with you the baptism of children. You'll know there are some denominations and church groups that baptize children because they believe that's their entrance into the body of Christ. And they do it with a sincere heart. They do it because they don't want children to be outside of the family of God. But the Bible talks about a believer's baptism. Repent and believe. Repent and be baptized. And so it's our understanding of the scripture that in order to be baptized, you have to have repented. You have to have made a confession of your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and received his forgiveness in your life and thereby you've been born again. Well, <clears throat> we believe that children, there is a, an age of accountability, an age where they become mindful of their sinful condition and they too need to repent. Up until that time, there is a, a grace that they walk in of innocence uh, under the Lord. But you say, what is that age? Well, for long periods of time, people believed it was 12 years old. But the truth is, that was just a random assignment based on the thought that this is when, uh, in the culture of the time, that person becomes, for example, the males become men or, or the females become women in that understanding of their culture. But the truth is, we're living in an age when children are maturing much faster uh, they're being exposed to things and have a greater understanding of sin consciousness than ever before. So it's very likely that you would need to baptize children even at a younger age. But this is where discretion will have to be used in, to, in talking with the children and coming to the understanding that they know what water baptism means and that they understand that they have had sin in their life, that they've had to repent and give their heart to Christ. And in so doing, then you, can follow, then you can follow the Lord's admonition and baptize them in water if you believe they've had that born-again experience. Now, one other note of caution, and that is you cannot expect a child to know and have the fullness of understanding doctrinally uh, at the same level that you would a teenager or as even an, an adult, a younger adult, say, for example. There's different levels of maturity in the knowledge of God. But that doesn't limit the fact that if they have that sin consciousness and they ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and come into their heart, that they don't really understand what happened. In my own life, I was six years old and I gave my heart to the Lord. And I didn't, I, I mean, it wasn't something where I just uh, was kind of joining a group. It wasn't like that. There was a service at our church and I remember feeling conviction in my heart. What terrible sin had I done? None that I know of. I mean maybe maybe I'd been disobedient or something had happened but there was no great thing that stood out. But I recognized the need for Jesus in my life. 
And the love of God compelled me. And I talked to my mother right there in the pew. And we went forward. She went with me. And I gave my heart to Jesus. And it was a real time to be born again. Now, I lived under that tradition that kind of set the age a little older. So I wasn't baptized until I was about 12 years old, somewhere in that vicinity. But you as pastors and leaders and Christian workers can, can really determine if you'll use uh, some real sensitivity when someone should be baptized in water. And, of course, it's always better to err on the side of a person if you believe they might have that faith and they honor God and desire water baptism. And so just we don't want to, to pardon the pun, water down the significance of baptism in any way. We want to honor it even as Jesus honored it and gave himself, uh, himself to water baptism as well. And so when you read in the scriptures, just for the sake of our discussion here a moment, you might ask the question, what is the order in which these spiritual things happen in our life? Uh, salvation, being born again, water baptism, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, which we'll discuss in another lesson. And the answer is, it all starts with salvation, but it, then it's God can have his way. Because you remember in Acts chapter 10, Peter comes through a heavenly vision, comes and, and ministers at Cornelius' house, Gentiles. It's a major breakthrough in the spreading of the gospel. He's teaching about Jesus. He's sharing with them about Jesus when spontaneously, even before the altar call, they begin to speak in other tongues. I mean, it was a work of God in their life. And so afterwards, the comment came, who can prevent them? In fact, it says this, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so we need to be careful not to try to put God in a box, but we need to understand there is the need for repentance and coming to Christ. And then whether they're baptized in the Holy Spirit first or baptized in water, they should be baptized. It's a good thing. Even they went then and were baptized uh, after receiving the Holy Spirit. So... Water baptism, what a beautiful and wonderful testimony of the work of Christ in our life. And then the second thing we want to talk about today is the Holy Communion, the sharing of communion. What a beautiful and wonderful ordinance that's been given in the church and a way for it, us to express the work of Christ in us. Hear these words. This holy ordinance symbolizes the broken body and shed blood of our Lord, our participation in the benefits of His atoning death, and the covenant which He sealed with His own blood. And that too came from P.C. Nelson's book. This is an incredible thing. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus establishes, institutes the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22:19. It says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Whenever you consider the scriptures, you have to also take a look at what the scripture says. Let me go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the 23rd verse. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You remember with water baptism, we talked about the fact that that was a public witness. Well, in a way, the Lord's Supper is the same and then has other significance as well. In the Lord's Supper, we have the opportunity on a regular basis to remember and to proclaim the Lord's death, His sacrifice for us, the provision of His life given to give us eternal life. And we can do so as often as we join together for that purpose. 
you say, well, how often really should we partake of the communion? Well, there's traditional ways in which people do so. Some uh, receive communion in their churches just once a month. They have one Sunday out of the month, and that's the time in which they partake together as the body of Christ. Others partake once a week. Others partake every single time that they meet. You might ask, what is my opinion? What do I think concerning that? I believe what the scripture says as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth his price, what he paid for us in order to be redeemed. So I believe it's something that can be done just as often as the Lord would uh, bless in every time we join together celebrating what he has done for us. Now you'll notice that there were in the scriptures some specific instructions that were given in that Corinthians passage uh, as the church at Corinth was gathering together, there were some abuses, there were some things that were going on. But remember, they would gather together for a meal. And so what was happening is you had some people that were coming and they were just eating lavishly while others were sitting aside hungry. And it just wasn't pleasing to the Lord, the atmosphere and the situation. Then you had the situation where some people were getting a little careless and lacking the reverence and the holiness that they should toward the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and His blood as symbolized through the cup. And so because of that, the scripture goes on in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and following. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. I want to pause there just for a moment. Real simple instruction here is that we should take a moment before we receive the communion and we should examine ourselves. And I would, I would say in that examination, you're asking the Holy Spirit to shine a light on anything that's not pleasing to God. You want to make sure there's no unrepented sin in your life. No unconfessed sin that you've allowed to, to be there. And you get that out as you're preparing to receive. And then it says, For anyone who drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Scripture says, Eating in an unworthy manner. First of all, none of us are worthy of our own doing. You know from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace we are saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So for us to receive communion at any point in time, it has to be by the grace of God. So the unworthy manner it's speaking of is a disregard for the reverence that is due such a time of worship. And so that's what it's speaking of. So we examine ourselves. We make sure that we have no unconfessed sin in our life, that we've repented that we're walk uprightly, walking uprightly before the Lord so that we can receive the provision of the Lamb of God who was slain for us. And we can partake of the communion in remembrance of that. And so I would say in faith of that which Christ has done for us, thereby applying all the blessing that God has given to us through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, and that he is risen and is alive, we can receive that unto ourselves. Because if we'll judge ourselves, it says we won't have to be judged. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 2. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So God loves us. And he longs for us to be in relationship with him. And so it's a matter of having a heart that has been searched and cleansed. And we allow the grace of God to work in us. And then we take of the communion in remembering what Christ has done for us. What he has provided for us. And we do this as often as we come together. As often as we're able to and desire to. We partake of the communion because it's a reminder of the blood that he shed and the suffering in his body and all that was provided for us through that. Now there are some who believe that whenever you partake of the communion 
it literally becomes the body and blood of Christ, transubstantiation. We call these ordinances rather than sacraments because we believe these are ordained of the Lord for us to practice, but it is by faith. And so the blood and the bread or the body and the juice, whatever you might describe it as, all the provision that Christ made through his flesh, through his blood, we receive by faith as we remember what he has done for us. And so in communion, we're looking back to what Christ has done, but we're also looking forward to what he has in store for us. And remember, Jesus made the statement in Matthew 26, 29, that there would not come a time until uh, that he would eat and drink with us again. He was speaking to the disciples until it was anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. And so we're looking to that glorious time, that blessed hope. Titus 2, 13 says, Hence, it keeps us looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So communion is really past, present, and future. It's looking past to what Jesus did for us. In the present, the provision of his promise through his suffering and shedding of his blood. Then the resurrection, which also points to the future that we have when we'll join together again one day, anew, there before the throne of God with Christ in our heavenly form. It'll be a glorious time that we'll share together. The cup, of course, is the fruit of the vine. It represents the blood of Jesus. Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Blood and covenant are strongly related. And it was through the blood that Jesus wrote this covenant with us that we receive by faith. He paid the price. It was not of our ability to do that. And this covenant that we have in him is ratified through his blood. What a powerful symbol it is for us when we receive of that and are a part of that in our lives. And of course, the bread. The bread represents the bread of life. And it's important that we understand it signifies the death of our Lord on behalf, uh, on our behalf. In other words, he became the Paschal Lamb. He became the Lamb uh, for us in our place. He took our sins, the sacrificial Lamb, to deliver us from sin and death. He was slain, Roman, uh, Revelation 13, 8 says, from the foundation of the world. God had a plan in Christ to make it possible for us. There's one other thing I want to say about communion, and that is communion is a healing meal. It's a time that we remember how Christ suffered. Remember in Isaiah 53, 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so we receive that promise, and we remember that through the body and the blood, through the bread and the cup. And we're reminded of what he has done for us to make possible the healing of our bodies. And remember how even the misuse of communion uh, would inflict the possibility of sickness in a person's life because they open themselves up to disobedience where the partaking in faith can open to us the healing power of Christ and give us strength and enable us to move forward. And what a wonderful blessing it is. And then don't forget communion. The very word speaks of another great significance of the practice of this ordinance. And that is it's the joining together of the body of Christ in fellowship around the table of the Lord as we share together in our faith, in our belief in Christ, in the provision that he made for us through his body and blood, as we're looking back, as we're believing for it now, and as we're looking to the future. So these two ordinances are the baptism in water, or water baptism, and Holy Communion. And remember, as we reflect on communion, we're not just looking back, but we're also anticipating 
his soon return. So it keeps us looking forward as well. God bless you. Thanks for being with us. Today.